Hello and welcome to Talking Europe. A six-page letter that took nine months to write was finally signed, sealed and delivered to the EU this week. It marked the beginning of the process of withdrawal of the UK from the bloc. Those negotiations, however, are not expected to begin until at least mid-May and topping the agenda, we believe, EU citizens and, of course, the money matters. Before those talks start, we're going to look at the current state of the Eurozone. It is said to be recovering, but will Brexit break that upward trend? Real GDP has grown 15 consecutive of quarters according to the EU Commission, a sign that steady, if not spectacular, improvement is being met. However, not all countries are benefiting. Greece, for example, is still struggling and fears are rising that another financial rescue could soon be on the cards. To help us see whether or not we're gearing up for another Greek drama, whether in Greece or indeed elsewhere, I'm joined in studio by Greek MEP, Ms. Eva Kali. You're with the Socialist and Democrats. And beside you, I have from the same party, but on a country Pretty much at the opposite side of the economic scale, I have a German MEP Jakob von Weizsäcker. Also with us, we have two MEPs from the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats uh, from Finland, MEP Niels Torvalds, and from Spain, Enrique calvé -Chambon. Thanks to you all for being with me. Um, perhaps, uh, Mr. calvé -Chambon, I can start very briefly with your good self. Uh, before we move on to focus more on Greece and Germany, we have heard from the current president of the EU, uh, the Maltese uh, Prime Minister, saying the Eurozone now needs to mitigate any negative effect from Brexit. Do you think Brexit could put us back in a downward spiral? Well, Brexit will create problems at all levels, of course. We, we are not uh, able, I suppose, it, it, it should be uh, too imaginative to know exactly how much, exactly what and when. It, de it depends on uh, the attitude of the negotiators. But I don't think that the greatest uh, problem will be the euro. No, no, the, the euro, because uh, the United Kingdom was not in it, no. No, the greatest problem for the moment seems to be that uh, yesterday it was not simply uh, <clears throat> delivery of a, of a decision. It was a sort of declaration of war by Mrs. Uh, May. And, well, I always, as, as a rugby man, I always liked struggle. And it will be very hard. Uh, Mr. von Weizsäcker, how do you see those negotiations very briefly going uh, with the Brexit? Everybody, I imagine, will want the best possible outcome. You know, we heard Angela Merkel, you know, saying, you know, being tough, saying, well, we're going to settle the divorce bill first and then talk about trade. But when it comes down to it, everybody benefits from staying calm, no, and finding the best route for everyone. I think the sequence of negotiating the divorce first and then uh, worry about uh, the uh, final state uh, of our relationship later um, I think is a very reasonable one, and we should try to stick to that. Uh, but of course, there will be an economic cost, just as the creation of the single market uh, created a lot of wealth. When you destroy part of the single market by one country leaving it, you're going to destroy some wealth, and it's unavoidable. Mm -hmm. And I only hope that uh, we'll be able to be mutually in these negotiations reasonably generous in the interest of a future good relationship. Unfortunately, I don't have very high hopes on that front from the UK. The UK is negotiating from a position of weakness. Um, and, and so I fear they may not be in the right mood to be generous. And of course, in the EU itself, in the EU27, we have some unresolved difficulties. The Euro, the Schengen area, some security matters. And, and so my greatest concern is that uh, in the negotiation, both parties operating not at their best, not at the greatest strength, um, could get bogged down in details that probably wouldn't be worth fighting about too much. Very briefly, because I want to move on to the Greek question, but just, do you think the UK then will leave the single market? Do you see, uh, like Mr. calvé uh, May was taking a very hard-line defence against the rest of the EU? We don't take a hard line, but we can't be soft either. So this is going to take, um, my guess would be five years, and the outcome won't be, it will be almost a catastrophe for, for the UK. It will be, not be good for us, that's in short. OK, so that, the future on the Brexit question doesn't look bright. In the much more immediate future, however, we are looking at the Greek question. And, you know, there were concessions, I believe, from the Greek government this week saying that they're going to cut again, uh, you know, pensions, for example, uh, down another 1% of GDP by 2019. Miss Eva Ekali, how bad is the situation in Greek? How close are we to another Greek tragedy? 
Well, I would say it's a continuous drama. It hasn't been resolved, so we're not uh, exiting any memorandum soon. Uh, I'm also afraid because the agreement seems to be an eternal memorandum for measures until 2050. Uh, I do believe it's going to be a difficult uh, closure of the evaluation and the cost is going to be paid by someone. It seems that uh, it's going to be the Greek taxpayers again. Unfortunately, all the sides have a part to blame of the responsibility now for this, uh, um, this new, uh, I think, way of trying to package the, um, the evaluation because they all made mistakes. One part of it is that they didn't focus to the reforms. They tried to gain time, all of them, because of the uh, in internal, maybe political uh, uh, situation of its country and they took advantage of it and it was convenient for everybody and Greece, by overtaxation and austerity but no reforms, we are still in a vicious circle. Mr Torvalds, do you think that that should be what the EU is pushing for? Because austerity measures in Greece seem pretty harsh already. It seems on that level, how much further can we push a people? Uh, is it not reforms that, that, that should be focused on? Well, the Greeks have been writing dramas for 2,500 years, so they are very good at it. Uh, <clears throat> But uh, we already heard uh, something about the uh, pension system. And if you have a pension system which is paid directly from the budget, that's a catastrophe for any country. Because then you have to use sort of current money to pay something which is growing and growing and growing. So uh, the question of what kind of, of reforms you are able to make from a political point of view and the willingness to do them, that's sort of... That's a break Where everybody report. gets bogged down because I believe that Greece spends 13.3% of GDP on pensions. That does sound very high. Well, they do pay also a very high price for uh, defence and for migration, which is a cost that is unbearable for a country like Greece and also to tax, tax heavens of the north. Yeah. So I would say that this is a higher cost and we haven't even touched that. And I think we should because with that just with the Brexit, we discuss about the European defence policy and we have to understand that this is something that somebody will have to pay the cost and you cannot say that it's uh, um, something that only the South can take care of. It's unbearable. It, it, was, it used to be more than 10 billion per year for a country like Greece, almost as high of our GDP as uh, UK and US, the okay. third country. So maybe uh, looking in, in different envelopes could be part of the solution. Uh, Mr. Calvé Chambon, the IMF, which you know is still weighing up whether it wants to get on board with, you know, supporting the current bailout and the next part of it to be paid. It says that Greece is being asked to do the impossible, that this target of 3.5% surplus of GDP is just too far. Then the EU side says, well, it's very realistic given the way their economy is going. Which, where do you see it? I think that we are touching, in my opinion, the real big mistake of, the <clears throat> of Europe or the Eurozone at the very beginning. Uh, IMF was... Uh, uh, very used to, to, to cope with this kind of problems. They had very good uh, civil servants, they have experience, they have that. But instead of uh, making uh, IMF, uh, uh, letting IMF make his job at the very beginning, at the first crisis, we say, no, 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 let us, let us do it as a Eurozone, etc. We are going to take care of that. I, they were not able to do it. And they, they didn't solve, they didn't take the good relation. And they started from a very, mm, I don't say ignorant, but very, because it was a de facto, I think they, they, they knew they were mistaken, but a very irrealistic position. It's that Greece will be able to give back the money. And the IMF said that simply, it's simply not possible. Even if Greeks sell all his islands, the partner, etc., he won't be able. And that is true, and that happens a lot of times in the history of the world. And that's what IMF have done many times. But we keep, we stick to that, we keep the, the, of this idea of debt relief, etc. First time it was to give um, the money back to the European banks, French, German, mm. etc. Now that's solved. Now I don't know why we are still, but we, and IMF is right in saying we must invented some kind of debt relief, that is, maybe bonus for at 100 years, 0.5%, anything of that. Because otherwise, 
the, the, there is no solution for the growth, uh, real growth. The it's primary funny. surplus, you know, it depends on statistics. Uh, sometimes you get it, and some, sometimes the statistics sure. are not so, so true. Yeah. I will agree that the primary surplus 3.5 seems irrational. And also we are not included in the quantitative easing, which makes it impossible to start growth. So this will make impossible the debt without restructuring to deal with it. But uh, I still believe that we have one, one part of the blame because we have a populistic, nationalistic yes, government course, now. Eh? So we try to support Greece, but at the same time we have to push forward for the reforms. Yeah, and yeah. As, as you say, this is now a blame game between IMF and the institutions because they said this is the policy mix and it's not working. So austerity is not working. Uh, Mr. Torvalds, though, is it not to some extent, if you hear the IMF line, is there not a sense of throwing good money after bad? I mean, the third bailout in seven years and still, you know, not looking like the economy is going to take off in the way the EU hopes? I think the sticking point, if you look at the IMF, they have always been more pessimistic than the Commission, uh, sometimes for good reasons because the sticking point is uh, the reforms. You have the decisions about the reform, but you don't have the implementation of the reforms. And that has actually to do with a administrative system, which is, you know, we are, of course, in Finland, we are, we are very, 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 very strict. And if the administrative system doesn't work, then we say that it should, has to be remade. It's, of course, very much complicated in, in Greece. We, okay. and therefore, we should sometimes be slightly, slightly careful with our advice. Take into consideration so. how different countries work. Uh, Mr. von Weizsäcker, uh, you know, the other finger of blame is often pointed to the Eurozone in general, notably to Germany, which is the one country that really has a very good economy, a surplus. Uh, a lot of people saying Germany not spending enough, and this is, you know, having a, a crippling effect on other parts of the Eurozone. The immediate effect of Germany spending a little bit more on Greece, unfortunately, is so small that even though it would help a little bit, it wouldn't fix the problems of Greece. So I think uh, that's not uh, realistic. Similarly, and I think I think that's the the, the, the key here. Uh, we, we need we need a dose of realism in Greece. Um, we're a long way away from having achieved in Greece the sort of reforms that are needed to really get the country back on its feet again. And the other healthy do dose of realism we're going to need, and it's been mentioned, not everybody is going to get their money back. Um, and I'm very grateful to the IMF in pointing out both, saying Greece truly needs much more reforms, both in, in the law and in implementation. And uh, um, creditors do get realistic. Um, basing uh, a debt sustainability analysis on 10 years of 3.5% uh, primary surplus is probably not the most realistic way to go. Uh, do you guys agree that, you know, it's not actually the fact that one country, Germany, is doing better, that that's not having a negative impact on the IRS, this idea that Germany exports much more than it imports? It's Well, I am personally... Uh, my colleague Jacob Bepi is not agree. Uh, personally, I consider that uh, when you have in a united, uh, uh, united economic zone with a, a unique money, uh, the, the disequilibrium should be tackled by both parties. Of course, we, for instance, Spain. Now, I'm not speaking about Greece. Of course, we have uh, uh, to, to make our reforms and to, of course, to give back the money and to make sacrifices, but also the ones that have surpluses have to put energy and, uh, in, in, in the recuperation of the economy and should spend more and should write uh, the civil servants, etc., uh, etc. Et but that is a general problem. That's not solving the problem of Greece. And that I agree with, with, with my, my, my colleague. Things the way are arranged in the bigger, much bigger country than, than, than Greece, and it's called California. California is also, yes, it's a United Money zone, much bigger, much important, but simply, every pencil you, the governor, decided to buy is under the auditor of... So we just need to be stricter, uh, of, basically, of have better accountants. Uh, Mr. Torvalds, is and that the solution? In just having better bookkeeping? No, but it's very easy to, to blame the Germans. They can be blamed for almost anything during the last centuries. Uh, <laughs> It's and not it's, not, it's not a question except of... Except on the migration crisis. But it's perhaps. not a question of, of just good bookkeeping. 
it's more in a way a cultural issue. If if you have, I think uh, there is a tendency in Greece to go back to the go good old days of Constantinople, mm -hmm. sort of the, the when when half of Rome was there, and I think there is a good piece of romanticism in the Greek. Not accepting the reality then? Of, their, of their, themselves. So very briefly, because we are running out of time, how hopeful are we that Greece is going to turn things around? Mr. Von Weizsäcker? I'm not very optimistic in the short run, but in the longer run, if we get there, I am optimistic. Unfortunately, it takes much more time to sort out the problems that we have, partly because we're not as well organized as we should be in the euro area. But if we manage to um, deal with each other reasonably, uh, and if we are sufficiently patient, in the end, we will get there. So in the long run, I'm optimistic, provided that we are all pragmatic uh, in, in the process of getting It there. seems that we've taken off the table the idea of Greece leaving the Eurozone. Ms. Cavalier, you are also hopeful for the future of your country? Of course I am. I think we need uh, basically to conclude the evaluation. Uh, I think fixing the interest rates will be really helpful and from, from uh, the side of uh, EU. I think to conclude the third pillar of the banking union, so EDIS, will bring more certainty to the South and the banks, which is uh, gaining, regaining trust from the citizens. It's good for the whole of Europe. You know, in France, Euroscepticism is a big problem and France has been really supportive to us also, to, to the Greeks. Mm -hmm. and, and I do hope that in Germany we're going to have Schulz winning the election, so this could actually be a very optimistic uh, uh, development. Okay, British. clearly a lot to be done there in terms of the economy, but a pretty positive view from Brussels. Well, thanks to my guests for having joined us. Thanks also to Tom for having watched this half of the show. Join us after the news when I'll be speaking to Gilles de Kirchhoff all about terrorism and security here in the EU.